There's heaps to do on modern cruise ships, but most of the passenger areas are found in parts of the ship above the waterline. So today, we're diving into those areas that are below the waterline and discovering what exactly is under the water. Hi, I'm Chris Frame. I'm a maritime history author and lecturer. I speak at maritime museums and onboard cruise ships around the world. I'm also the co-host of the Big Cruise podcast. I'll link it in the description. If you're interested in cruise ships, cruising or maritime history, I think you're going to like it here. So hopefully you'll subscribe at the end of the video. The different parts of a ship have different names. Above the waterline, you'll find the mast, the funnel, the bridge, and superstructure. The part of the ship that sits in the water is called the hull. And the part of the hull that's below the waterline, well, that's what we are focusing on today. We'll start with the basics. The very bottom of the ship is known as the keel. In older ships, this was generally the first part of the ship to be built and was essentially the backbone of the ship. The supporting ribs onto which the hull was built were attached to the keel and the ship was built up from there. These days, with prefabrication techniques being used, ships are built quite differently. Various sections or blocks are built separate from each other and welded together to form the ship. In some cases, such as Queen Anne, the whole forward end of the ship was built at a different shipyard to the aft. The forward end was launched and towed to another shipyard to be joined together. The distance between the waterline and the keel is known as the ship's draft. The size of the draft is important for multiple reasons. Firstly, the part of the ship that is underwater is critical for the ship's stability. Too much weight above the water and not enough below can make the ship unstable or prone to listing. In worst case scenarios, ships can capsize, like the Mary Rose did all the way back in 1510. An example of a passenger ship where the centre of gravity was too high was the Hamburg America liner Emperator. When first put into service, the ship had a noticeable listing problem and attracted the rather unfortunate nickname Limperator. To overcome this problem, the ship was returned to her builders to have remedial works done. This included removing marble fixtures and fittings in favour of lighter alternatives and replacing heavy furniture with wicker. They also poured concrete into the double bottom of her hull to further lower the ship's centre of gravity. The depth of the draft also has an impact on where the ship is able to visit. The ocean liners of old had deep drafts. This was often due to the large mechanical spaces required to run the ship's reciprocating engines and the cargo space that was required for them to be able to be profitable. A deep draft also helped give these ships good sea keeping qualities, making them very suitable for running line voyages, but it often made them impractical in a cruising role. So let's look at a modern cruise ship to get an idea of what lies beneath the waterline just from the markings on the hull. The markings here indicate the placement of the bow thrusters while these ones indicate where you'd find the stabilizers. These items need to be below the water in order to be effective, and the markings show where they are located to ensure that tugs and other craft do not cause damage or interfere with their operation. Another very noticeable feature is the bulbous bow. These large bulbs help with the hydrodynamic efficiency of a passenger ship and improve the stability of the vessel. And in port, when the ship is stationary, you can often see the top of the bulb poking out above the waterline. Bow thrusters, and on ships that have them, stern thrusters, allow the ship to maneuver under their own power. Stern thrusters are generally only installed on ships with traditional propellers rather than rotatable pods. Ships with propellers have a rudder below the waterline, which is used to turn the ship when it is underway. But the bow and stern thrusters improve their maneuverability in port. Many modern cruise ships have been built with azipods. These sit below the ship rather like giant outboard motors and can rotate to turn the ship as needed. These take the place of the traditional propellers and the rudder. These pods can be huge. For example, on the Queen Mary 2, they're each the same weight as a Boeing 747 jetliner, and QM2 has four of them. Other things found below the waterline are the intake and outlet pipes for the collection of water, the discharge of water, and ballast. If you're interested in learning more about these, please let me know. The final thing you'll probably have noticed about the ship below the waterline is that it's a different colour to the rest of the ship. Being in the water all the time, ships attract an array of wildlife and marine growth that over time build up and cause the ship to become less efficient. To prevent this, ships are painted with anti-fouling paint designed to discourage marine growth. This paint has traditionally been red due to the natural pigment of many of the anti-fouling agents. 
On the old wooden sailing ships, thin sheets of copper were used to protect the wood and act as an anti-fouling agent. So now we know what you'd see below the waterline from the outside of the ship, but what about on the inside of the ship below the waterline? As I mentioned, most passenger areas on ships are located above the waterline. This means that there can be portholes, windows and balconies, allowing for natural light into the passenger spaces and providing easier ventilation. So what is below the waterline? Depending on the ship, areas below decks will house the engines and associated machinery, water treatment and desalination plants, ballast tanks, fuel bunkers, cargo holds, storerooms, and some crew amenities. Looking for the ship's stash of champagne and caviar? There's a good chance it's below the waterline, as the massive holds and cold storage rooms are located in these areas. Many ships have special lifts that offer direct access from these stores to the galleys. Now I said earlier that most passenger areas on ships are located above the waterline, but there are some exceptions. One of the most interesting is the Blue Room lounges located on the Penant ships. These lounges have a view out under the water, with the idea being to provide a connection with the ocean around you. You'd also often find some passenger spaces at or below the waterline on ocean liners of old, and even quite recently. The QE2, for example, which retired in 2008, had a passenger pool and gym located on Deck 7 on the waterline. There were no portholes on this deck. So there you have it. Next time you travel on board a ship, you'll have a bit of a better idea as to what's under the waterline. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please don't forget to give it a like and don't forget to subscribe for further maritime history and cruising content. Thanks once again for watching. Until next time, I hope to see you on board.